In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's be seated. If someone were to ask, what makes Episcopalians unique? What is it to be Anglican or Episcopalian? What would come to mind? Some of the things we've used over the years to describe ourselves, uh, one would be the via media, that we are that middle road, that middle road between the Roman Catholic Church uh, and the Protestant Church, liturgically the middle of the road, theologically and politically the middle of the road. Some have also used the term that we're a big tent, that whether you're way over here or way over here, that there are core truths that bind us together and the rest that we can disagree on, uh, but that we can still come together as one body. Prayer book is another thing that distinguishes us, that, uh, that we believe less uh, doctrinally as much as that our praying shapes our believing, uh, or that lex orende, lex credendi, so we pray, so we believe. Um, and then there's that three-legged stool. That we've never left our minds at the door, that we are called to bring our intellect, uh, our reason, uh, and, 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 and engage that with Scripture and what Scripture tells us and what the traditions of the church have told us, and we bind those together uh, to form what we believe. But if you ask me, what makes us Anglican, at the very beginning of that conversation, uh, I would believe is that we have an incredibly strong doctrine of the Incarnation. What does that mean? What does that mean? I think at the very core, I think it means that we believe wholeheartedly that li this life matters. That what we do in this life matters to God. That this life is not just about keeping a clean sheet so that we can get to the ever after, but that this life matters incredibly incredibly to God. It mattered in creation when God looked upon all creation, made us in God's image and said it was good. It matters in that God cared enough to come in the flesh, to walk uh, as we've walked, to live as we've lived. And so justice matters. Our care for the poor, our care for one another, what we do with this life matters. And I think that that is a core element of who we are as Episcopalians, as Christians. I think the incarnation is one of the most important elements of our faith. And each of the gospel writers understands that a little bit differently. And the one thing that uh, I think is critical for us to do is to take a look at what each gospel writer understands about not just what happens, but about what that means in terms of what we believe. One of the things I do with our third grade class when uh, we're getting ready for Christmas in early December, our Bible lesson, uh, is to put together our Christmas pageant and then figure out where it came from. Uh, we put together all those things you expect to find in a Christmas pageant, uh, the Annunciation, uh, the visiting of the wise men, uh, the shepherds, uh, the manger scene, uh, you name it. We put it all there on the top along the top, and then we put uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John along the side. And we say, well, where did our story come from? We realize, uh, much like journalism, uh, it comes from several different reports about what happened. But what does the incarnation mean to each of these people? Let's start with Luke. I think in a word, Luke understood the incarnation to mean that everything was turned upside down. That everyone who felt like they didn't matter to God, everyone the church said, you are less than, was treasured and exalted. That Magnificat, that beautiful passage of Mary, uh, the peasant girl, the unwed peasant girl, who becomes the most important character in human history. The peasant girl, a person who is pretty much nameless and without status to the world, becomes the Theotokos, the God-bearer, the one for whom the whole story hinges. And I invite you to take a, a, a picture in your mind of the Christmas pageant Luke tells, of what Luke, Linus tells to uh, the people in Peanuts uh, as, as they're fighting and missing the whole spirit of Christmas when he tells that narrative in Luke. What does that image look like when they're all gathered around that newborn child, around the incarnation? 
Mary and Joseph, a carpenter of, of, of little consequence, uh, a peasant a girl who's unmarried, a vulnerable uh, person. Uh, you have uh, not a castle, uh, but a stable. You have the Christ child, the king of kings, put into a feeding trough. And the first people that are made aware of the story uh, are not the exalted, well, not the religious leaders, not the political leaders, but the shepherds who sleep out in the cold with sheep. Everything in Luke has been turned upside down. God is making not just an incredible entry into the world, uh, but he's showing the world what matters. And it's not the things that matter in this world. And you can't look at the incarnation in Luke without seeing that things turn upside down. And there's a great breaking open in Matthew's telling of the story. Uh, Matthew goes to such length to tie the story from the location of Bethlehem to that incredibly long list of, of genealogy that goes through about how this is what the people of Israel have been waiting for ever for. This is the fulfillment of that story that has been told and passed on from generation to generation. But as soon as the story happens, it's broken open. The first people made aware of it are from halfway around the world, and they know about it because it is so profound that the world will no longer be the same. The stars are out of alignment. It has shattered and vibrated all of creation. And three people who have very little knowledge of the Jewish faith know that their lives and this world has been changed forever. <coughs> And those reverberations lead them all the way from the distant lands that they come from to pay homage to this new king, the king of kings. And we also get that collision of humankind with the divine in the brokenness of Herod and his uh, earthly power being shaken and made vulnerable because of a new king. That's Matthew's story. <laughs> And John doesn't paint a narrative so much as he paints with words. And his story is about the fact that the incarnation is not something brand new, but is the fact that that same God who has been there from before creation ever happened, that same God who has been invested in our lives, who has shown hope and light into our lives, is the God that breaks into the world and the God that will be with us forever. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and all things came into being through Him. And then that Word, that Word that God from the very beginning became flesh and dwelt among us. That God Himself came, God who was there in all creation, came and dwelt among us. And that that shone a light into the world that the world, no matter what, could not extinguish. A light shined into the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. That's how John describes it. But then we have Mark, and Mark doesn't even discuss Jesus' childhood. And one of the things we discussed on Thursday, would it be enough if all we had is that oldest gospel? If all we had was Mark's account, would it be enough for you to be here today? Would it be enough for the incarnation to take root? In Mark's story, we start by the rivers of the Jordan. And we start with John the Baptist. We start with baptism. And most people um, uh, have come to believe uh, that Mark was really preparing people for baptism, that this gospel was written as a catechism for those deciding whether or not they were willing to be baptized, knowing uh, that it may lead to death, that uh, in an incredibly persecuted church, that the decision whether or not to be baptized may be the decision that leads them to death. Are they willing to jump in? And they start by the River Jordan. Jesus has grown. And John's herald what is to come. Um, <clears throat> but Jesus comes to be baptized. So take a picture and picture this as Mark's incarnation story. What the incarnation is about to Mark. And I have to tell you, uh, last year when I was uh, uh, by the River Jordan, there is no place uh, that I was able to visit in all of Bethlehem, Jerusalem, uh, Nazareth, uh, that struck me as more of a colliding place between people's thirst for God and God's real concrete presence than in the Jordan. Not in Bethlehem, not in any of the chapels or cathedrals, not in the, the place of the cross. Uh, 
But right there in the water of the Jordan where people still come singing uh, uh, from different uh, walks of life, from different parts of the world, uh, still being baptized, it is a collision between God and God's people there in the Jordan. And Mark captures it. First of all, why is Jesus coming to be baptized in Mark's story? Uh, one of the important things to realize is that baptism uh, before this moment is not what baptism is every baptism after this moment. We get that in the story from Acts, uh, that John's baptism was not what baptism would be after this moment in time. It was essentially a shower. It was like that scene in any movie uh, where the adulterer or the murderer uh, takes a shower to wash away those things that they've done wrong. Uh, it was uh, a cleansing uh, from sin. And so Jesus walks into those waters to be baptized and washed clean of all of uh, his sins. Why is he doing that? Because the incarnation is real. Because God is fully human. Not just tiptoeing into human life, but becoming fully pregnant in what it is to be human. In all of our disappointments and the New Year's resolutions that have already failed, uh, in our, our doubts, uh, in our infirmities, uh, in our... Uh, brokenness in the way that we treat one another and the things that we've said that we would do and we forgot to do them or the things that we've said that we wish we could take back in all of the things that we have done uh, that we regret and all of the things that we want to wash clean God has entered into so picture that image picture a great artist able to draw all of those infirmities into the water like the gleam uh, 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 on top of the water uh, all of the things that it is to be human the things that we think God would find unlovable about ourselves. The things that we think make us untouchable. All of that gleaming on, uh, on the surface. And Jesus enters into it. And then when Jesus comes out of the water, uh, an amazing thing happens. Mark doesn't just say the clouds separated and all of a sudden there was a dove and the spirit. Uh, it is a violent word. And picture the way that they understood the world back then. They pictured the world a little bit like a snow globe. Uh, that uh, the world was this and God was on the other side of the glass. That God had made the world, uh, uh, but God was on the other side of the glass. And in Mark, the words as Jesus comes out of the water, uh, representing all of us, not just representing, becoming all of us. The heavens were torn apart. That snow globe was cracked open. God descends and says, this is my child my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. To Jesus, as squarely as to you and to me, he says, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. You know the other time that God shatters that divide between humanity and God in Mark? It's right at the end, right on the cross, when the skies turn dark and that shroud uh, between the holies of holies is cut all the way down in, in half and opened up. To Mark, this is God taking on everything that is human and tearing apart the divide between God way up here and us feeling way down here. So does the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan hold? Could we have the story if we didn't even have the beautiful story from Luke, the story from John, or the story from Matthew? I think it does. Because it captures what it is to have a God who cared enough to come into human form and to be made flesh. And a God who tells us with every bit of God's capacity to tell us, your life matters. All of it. And it is worthy of God. Amen.